Thanks to Dethrone Visa and MasterCard as they look to alternate payment processors. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And the banks are looking to take control of your payment processing and cut out the fat cats at Visa and MasterCard. Let's over to the Wall Street Journal headlines that banks way using Zelle to challenge Visa and MasterCard as a money transfer service boomed amid the pandemic and some banks want to expand it to retail payments. Banks are debating a plan to bring Zelle to the checkout at big retailers as the money transfer service boomed during the pandemic when people avoided ATMs and replaced cash and checks with digital money transfers. Zelle recorded some 180 billion transactions in 2021, totaling 490 billion, more than their double their pre-pandemic levels. And really what this starts to become an issue is of cashless transactions. You know, you look at what's going on and people believe that you need things like cryptocurrencies to really replace cash and really all we need is a system that perhaps is more efficient and less expensive than the traditional credit card processing and what we're seeing now is due to the high cost of using companies like Visa and MasterCard other companies like Zelle are starting to get in the market and perhaps cut them out and leading consumers into the cashless future let's continue on because the growth has opened up new possibilities for Zelle and has sparked a disagreement among the banks that own it, a group that includes J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. At the center of the debate is whether in the bank's best interest to promote a payment option that competes with card networks, Visa, and MasterCard. And of course, when you start cutting out the biggest players, well, there are certainly to be some backlash to the banks. But the banks got their eyes on this because they know just how much Visa and MasterCard are raking in on your transaction charges, and you bet they want a piece of that. And banks collectively have earned billions of dollars each year from fees merchants pay when shoppers use credit and debit cards. A payment option that moves funds directly between shoppers and merchants' bank accounts could chip away at that. But Visa and MasterCard currently set the fees and take some for themselves, which we know the banks would love to have, and sidestep the card networks would allow the banks to set the rules and their fees on their own. And if you can only imagine having your own bank set hit the rules on how you're going to use your payment processing, well, that doesn't sound too appetizing, at least not to me. And some banks are reaching out to merchants to gauge interest in a pilot that would allow them to accept Zelle for online payments as soon as this year. How it would work, what to charge the merchants for the service, and what the incentives to offer consumers are all being debated. But this could be a big deal for merchants because there is a cost to using cash. Now, I know you might not think that, but they have to manage cash. You have to store cash. You have to transport in the bank. There is a cost, maybe not a direct one that you can see compared to a uh, credit card, but there is a cost to using cash. So if merchants can get away from cash and go completely to a cashless system, particularly one that charges them significantly less than the typical credit card processing fees, well, could be big for them and streamline their businesses in a way that we haven't seen before. And meanwhile, three banks plan to launch a pilot that will allow people to use Zelle and send rent payments to a couple of large property managers, according to people familiar with the matter. And rent for years has been a sector that card networks have been trying to gain traction without much success. Well, who wants to pay the rent and pay a transaction fee on top of that? But what's key here is getting consumers to use the product will open them to using it at other places. And I think that's really important. Now, something else that happened today that's really important if we saw a record low number, well, almost a record low number, and U.S. jobless claims fell last week to the ma match the lowest since 1968 as applications dropped by 5,000 to 166,000 in a week that ended April 2nd. And what this means, according to the data and the experts, is there is a persistently tight labor market, and the Fed, as you know, doesn't like that. Well, I went back to the data, and here it is, initial claims, it actually got to low of 162,000, so it is indeed the lowest level since 1968, but it is not the record low on the books. Maybe we'll see that, who knows? The drop in the first time applications is yet another sign of positive momentum for the labor market and weekly unemployment claims have been falling most of the year alongside declining COVID-19 cases and solid consumer demand that's supporting business growth, including hiring. But as we already know, without fiscal stimulus, now a massive withdrawal in monetary systems. Uh, monetary stimulus that the consumers are going to have a major problem keeping up with the spending, particularly with inflation running out of control. So this, what is likely to happen now is a complete reversal of these low trends and in initial claims. 
and more likely now to head higher. As a separate report last week showed that the U.S. added close to half a million jobs in March, an unemployment rate fell by more than expected, further highlighting labor market strength. And on an unadjusted basis, initial claims only decreased to 193,000 last meet. And what this means now is when you hit a low in unemployment claims, now maybe it goes lower, but when you get to these you know, historically or near historic low levels, the next direction is higher. And I'm gonna show you in the next charts because what's coming and what it suggests, we're about to have a massive recession. And if we're lucky, we won't have a financial crisis, but with the Fed at the helm, well, we know that we're going to. But one thing that shouldn't endure a financial crisis, and that's your portfolio, be sure to check out Portfolio Shield. I'll put a link up there in the corner and the description below. And now let me show you what's coming for the labor market. And here you can see before we get to that, that total claims even fell 52,000 to 1.7 million. And that says the Fed is on track. They're going to continue tightening in a major way. And here we see the four week moving average initial claims using that just to smoothen the data a bit. In blue and in red, we've got the University of Consumer Sentiment Survey. And what I want to show you is these are nearly mirror opposites of each other. Now they're not perfectly opposite, but you can see that when claims are at a very low level, then optimism in sentiment is very at a high level. And then when it's in reverse and claims are high, sentiment is very low. But I've had to cut off this chart because of the pandemic, but check this out. We know the sentiment is falling to really low levels and seemingly headed lower with no bottom in sight, which suggests, as what we're seeing in the data here, that initial claims should be skyrocketing higher. But we have a tight labor market for the moment. But is that going to last? Not a chance. And here I'm going to show you why. Because now let's overlay the yield curve. That's the 10-year treasury minus the two-year treasury. And that's in red against the four-week moving average of initial claims. And notice we have a much tighter relationship here. And where you see the yield curve bottom and rise, well, notably, we see the same thing happen for initial claims. And look at how nice a relationship that is. Now, again, I cut off the pandemic data so you could see this in a much larger screen. And now we'll go to a logarithmic format on initial claims. And you can see when claims get really low, well, obviously that means the yield curve is set to rise and we're going to head into recession. And of course, the yield curve at some point here in the near term future is likely to bottom out. And when it rises, what that means is short term rates, two year yields will fall faster faster than 10-year yields, and that means a recession is coming and initial claims are rising. So for the moment, we can enjoy the initial claims are low, but that's not going to last, and the Fed is going to tighten into a steepening yield curve, and they've never done that before, except this time. They say, not a chance of a recession, but history says we're going to have one anyways, and the Fed's only going to make it worse. And I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.